Hey, uh, uh, thanks everybody for coming. Uh, this is a, a big deal for me to get to speak in this group. I've, I've sat out there like you a few times with this group, and uh, I, I live outside of Philadelphia right now, so it, it's kind of a treat. I kind of try, I try to make at least two of these events every year. Um, nothing else, I get to walk around the city, but um, when I'm speaking in, or involved with uh, people who like web performance or, or, or understand it, it's like I'm with my people at this point because it, it, performance is a big deal to me. And as I kind of walk you through my journey on building single page applications over the last five or six years, um, performance really influenced the architecture uh, almost 100% uh, decision wise and, and, and just the, the relevance of building these applications the right way. So uh, there's a few faces I recognize, and I may have met you at some of these other meetings, and a lot of you are new to me, and I'm pretty sure I'm new to you. Uh, if you want to follow me on Twitter, I'm very active on Twitter, and I have been since day seven of Twitter. It's at Chris Love, hence I was there on day seven. I got my name. So, uh, and I blog. Try to I try to blog quite regularly. Uh, I've been for like eight or nine years, and it's and it's love to dev com, and uh, I do a lot of, you know, writing about things around web performance and generally web development related stuff. Uh, is what you're going to see on my blog, and uh, one of the things I like to do is uh, share resources on Twitter. And I've tried to start at like a links of the week, which is kind of like a resources and things that I found this week that were pretty interesting. I like to share, so hopefully that'll things like that'll be useful to you. Um, some other things about me: um, I'm kind of from the Microsoft world, uh, which is kind of interesting. When I go speak at web development groups and and, and in enterprise groups, I get kind of two totally different reactions. Um, but I've been an ASP.NET MVP for the last eight years, which is an award program Microsoft has, where they identify people who have a combination of uh, technical excellence, but also community activity. So things like speaking tonight is, is kind of one of the reasons why I keep maintaining that award. But I'm also an insider, and what that really means is I get a lot of dialogue with the ASP.NET team, which is the, the people that make the, the web stack technology at Microsoft, the server-side stack. Uh, in recent years, I've become an Internet Explorer user agent. We're gonna change the name of that probably to Edge something or others because obviously the Internet Explorer is a dead product at this point. Um, but over the last three years, I actually joined this, believe it or not, because I, I went over to try to pick a fight with them, and they asked me to kind of join this group, and it's been a fantastic experience. I've learned so much about how browsers work, and not only just Internet Explorer, but they've also introduced me to some of the guys on the Chrome team and Firefox team, and, and it's just been a lot of insight into the logic and, and the processing that goes on. Uh, in the in the browsers, whether it's JavaScript engine or the DOM or the CSS rendering and, and whatnot, it gives me a lot of insight on how to structure my applications too, um, which has helped me out. I've written a few books. Obviously, I speak, but I really like to identify myself as a, a as a web a web guy. I I, I kind of joke. I live above the API now. I used to do everything top to bottom, but I, I really kind of gravitated to everything in the browser and just I don't do as much on the server side anymore. Um, speaking of books, the, the last book that I wrote, it's about a year and a half old now, and I've, I've, got, an, I've got a bunch of books that I've kind of... Fandango and Flickster, and it actually uses the, the Flickster, the Rotten Tomatoes API. So I'm doing a presentation in Dallas early this year, and they took away the movie posters from their API feed. And when you've got an application that needs pictures and images that it's based on and they're no longer there, it doesn't really look that good. It still works just fine. It's just there's just a lot of you know, 404s on the images because they don't exist anymore. Uh, but that's, that's a Rotten Tomatoes thing. So I had to kind of scramble and write a brand new demo application where I controlled everything. And I only spent, it, I'm going to be flat out honest, I spent about 20 to 25 hours on this so far. Uh, and that's what we're going to actually walk through today. So there's there's some kinks to it and some simplified things, uh, more or less, but uh, the general concepts are there. Yes? Code, I'll show you. The next slide should have it. My, all my source code is up on GitHub that it, is publicly available. I have the repo. There's one called Movies, which is the, the books based on. There's another one called, uh, it's either Furniture or Fast Furniture, is the new application that I built. Um, so, and I have a bunch of other repos up there. I don't know how many. There's some libraries I've written, like Deep Tissue, which is a touch gesture abstraction library, and uh, Little, some other UI components and different things like that. Some of it's just sample code, but anyway, uh, this is the one slide you probably really need. This slide deck, for the most part, is already up there on SlideShare. I have made a few little graphical modifications to it, nothing substance wise, really. But uh, uh, the source code's on GitHub, github.com slash DOCLUV. That's an old nickname from high school. Uh, and then slideshare.net slash DOCLUV. Um, 
So if you're familiar with either one of those sites, you can go grab the source code that I'm gonna be walking through and you can go get this slide deck as well. All right, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna take you on a journey, kind of where I was and, and how I got to the point that I am building these single page applications. And it really, it really all started way back in like the 2008, 2009 timeframe. Uh, when jQuery was like everything. All the other developers I ever knew hated JavaScript. But jQuery finally made JavaScript usable. And then, you know, pretty quickly I started using jQuery UI and in particular the dialog uh, component of the, the jQuery UI uh, library. And if you're like me, you go try to break down how, did this, how does this stuff work? And Honestly, all I was doing was putting a div on a page, and it was hidden. So this is this is straight up. Invoke the dialog, it changes it from hidden to show. And based on the, the other stuff, you see the Z index of 101, that makes it overlay and stuff. So you get this modal dialog effect. And I was working on this one application in, like in 2009, I kept asking myself, I'm like, why am I going back to the server to get all the markup every single time something changes on the page? Is the mic going out on this, or is it me? So I started thinking, well, why can't I just like show and hide the entire application? Because it seems kind of wasteful to go back and forth because I'm doing most of my data interactions via uh, an API or an AJAX call. Is this one hot? Okay, we're good. Okay, maybe it was me. Anyway. So I started looking at that, I'm like, I'm getting data, and meanwhile, I was, I was starting to play with some things to render the markup and the data dynamically on the client. Meaning I wasn't rendering stuff on the server anymore. I was not really using ASP.NET that much, to be honest with you, at this point. And you know, one of the guys I worked with, he, he, he told me to call this thin ASP.NET, like a really thin act, you know, act ASP.NET application. I'm not really using the web form controls and all that stuff if you are familiar with that stack. And, uh, and, I, and I just kind of started playing with the concept of this. And it was a kind of a scary thing to say, let's just, let's just go off and do this, what we now call a single page application. I'm not sure the client would have bought into it because it was, it was totally new to them too. After that project wound up, doing a single page application primarily for performance ex uh, reasons, to be honest with you. It was, it, it had, I had to do it for user usability and everything. Let me give you some. Launched the product in mid-September. We went from nothing to 400 views. Now, I call a view, correlate that to a, to a traditional page. So we went from zero to 400 pages in like four months or something like that. So we made a pretty substantial sized application. The app Party people just drop in modules. I think if you can think about the jQuery plugin ecosystem at the time, that was kind of what we were thinking. We could build something that our customers and other people could just extend off this kind of root core. So I could kind of build that experience into all this as well. for a single page application, especially if you're coming from a performance uh, mindset like I tend to come from. game, And I was sitting there and striking up a conversation with the lady sitting next to me. And it turned out she was actually part of our target demographic for selling this app, this product. And so I whipped out my phone to show her the application, and I'm on Sprint 3G. Who who has Sprint? And yeah, not many people in New York. It's a Verizon city, but Sprint is really slow. Uh, for them to call it 3G was a shame. They really should have called it dial-up. Um, so yeah, a minute and a half later, the the homepage loaded, and I'd already lost her at that point. And if you're a web performance geek like I am you know at one second the mind starts wandering and by three seconds you've lost half the people. Well, this is like a minute or so later 
you know, the page loaded. And this is something that I built, and I felt embarrassed sitting there showing her this because it, I, well, a, I hadn't really tested it over a cellular network, which was which is a big mistake because we wanted this to be something that you could use anywhere on any device. And I hadn't tested on a cellular network at this point. We were getting close to launch, so it was kind of scary. And so I had to kind of figure out why did it take so long. And the reason was is because the payload was really large coming down. And if you're over something like a 3G network at that time, that was that was death, basically. A true mobile experience. I had done a couple of mobile-based applications at that point, but they were all line of business kind of targeting applications, and we hadn't really truly considered what that meant. But that, honestly, that experience sitting there at the ballpark that night just really sank into me just how, what it means to really truly be mobile and not be on Wi-Fi and, and be out and about. And like I said, make sure you test Most developers never go beyond that, and they think if it loads fast on their local machine, that's fine. And that's all they really think about. And even if you're building a line of business application, which is a lot of what I do, is work with enterprises building their business, their internal applications, the speed really matters because you've got cognitive load and, and other factors that come into the psychology of working with an application day to day. And the, the enterprise workforce is becoming more and more mobile, even if the developers in the IT department's not acknowledging it. When I go to airports, it I really sets in because I sit there and watch people, and they're not working on their, their business-issued laptop anymore. They're working on their mobile devices, and they don't want to use that laptop. They keep that in their bag because it's big and bulky, and they don't really want to have to go through all the corporate crap. So they figure out ways to get around it and work on their iPad and their, and their phones and, and whatnot. So... Um, testing on local host is not good enough anymore. You really need to get some sort of GPRS connection or at least some way to uh, mimic uh, a GPRS, which is a cellular connection. Um, that's one of the things I like in the Chrome developer tools. If you hit the little mobile icon in there, you can actually change to a simulated speed. It's not something that's 100% exactly what it would be on there, but it's, it's a guesstimate of what it would be like if you did load over a 3G or a 4G kind of network. And if you have paid attention to Tam Tammy Everts, uh, statistics stuff that she likes to, to share. Uh, a couple of weeks ago she shared something that has probably been out there for a little while, I just, it didn't resonate with me, but 20% of the U.S., their only access to the internet is over a cellular connection. And that kind of hit me, I'm thinking, where are these people? And then I thought, they're probably in New York City because y'all are all out and about walking around all the time and that's a number one thing. The other thing too is I've, the, the people who push back a lot about the net neutrality stuff, really wanting that, for people like here in New York City, because your, your landlords have, essentially have a contract, say, with Comcast or whatever, and you may not want them, right? You may want Fios or something. And so a lot of them kind of protest, and they just use a, a cellular connection to get their, their internet connectivity. So I'm not sure where the demographics are, but it, that did seem like something that would fit perfectly as people in New York City, because y'all are, aren't really home that much. You're out and about. I would be too, so. Okay. All right. Um, so... We've, we've eventually started calling it a single page application or a spa, which is kind of nice because now I can use these cool background images um, and everything. So, All right. I would consider back-end developers. And this whole front-end thing is a new adventure to them, and they're trying to, in my experience, pound in back-end architectures into the browser. And they're not succeeding, uh, especially from a performance point of view, because they're trying to do things that just the browser's not meant to do or, or the user experience in the front-end is not really designed to do. communications back to the server, getting data, and not necessarily markup.
and Sergey was talking about perp planets, uh, uh, cal was it perp calendar days or whatever, and, and they come out in December. And I was fortunate enough to have an article published by them. And what I did was I talked about uh, using local storage as a caching mechanism for data. And that's become a very important aspect of how I build spas, not just for data, but I actually cache my entire markup in there as well. And of course, like research papers and articles and stuff in our personal web space up there. And those articles were, were generally fairly long. You think about like white papers for engineers and stuff like that. But these are articles that a lot of times we were publishing in journals and things. So they could be 20, 30 pages long and they would usually have a table of contents at the top. If you want a kind of a modern reference, go to W3C and look at any kind of the, the specs and drafts of what's, you know, as far as HTML5 specs and things like that. Usually they follow the same format. They'll have a table of contents at the top, and then they're hyperlinked to content at the bottom. The reason that works is because of this hash fragment. If we used a query string, the request would go back to the server and cause a full round trip of everything. But this hash fragment changes the URL, and it causes the browser to look for an anchor tag that has a name that matches the value on the hash fragment. So what we learned to do for these single page applications was use this hash fragment to kind of drive our applications. And that gives us the ability not only to drive the application, but also have what we call deep linking. So that you can send a link to somebody and it will hydrate the content of whatever view or page that you're wanting to share to somebody else, just as if it was a regular hyperlink from, from legacy classic websites. And that was something that when I first started doing these single page applications, it didn't resonate with me to, to use because no one was doing this yet. But if you do this, you don't have to spend so much JavaScript uh, effort to drive your application, so to speak. You can just bind to this hash change event that's available in every browser. So when that hash fragment changes, it triggers an event, and you can spawn off any logic you need to go to from there. Things that I think developers don't realize is that they aggressively purge cache. So one of, the, one of the pushbacks I seem to get from the enterprise crowd about me preaching about web performance is, oh, just, just use a cached thing on the CDN. The problem that I found really quickly, especially back then, it's not, it's not the same numbers right now, but it's still a very similar experience. iPhone, Safari on iPhone back in 2010 did not cache anything that was over 25 kilobytes in size. So for example, jQuery would never get cached. So every single time you, you went and requested a new page on a site that used jQuery, you would download the entire library all over again. Any image that you used that was over 25 kilobytes, every single page request, it would come back over the cellular connection. It's very slow. It's one of the reasons why my application was slowly and really slow. I was using jQuery. Um, another problem is they have less memory. So they, they just can't hold as much in there. And this, this was a problem I didn't realize why I was crashing browsers until about three years later when we finally started getting tools where we could do memory profiling. And mobile devices don't have the memory available to them that desktops do. You know, my Surface up here has got eight gigs, which is more than enough for me. But, you know, I got my, my stepson a cheap phone, and he's got half a gig of RAM on that phone. Now, think about it. If you've got, a, if you've got a, a, even a drip of memory leak in your application and it's something that you want people to stay on over and over again, the browser's going to feel the memory pressure and the browser's going to crash relatively quickly. For example, even on this, I can crash Facebook usually within 10 minutes by scrolling through the timeline because there's so many memory leaks in Facebook. And this is stuff you want to avoid. And this was a problem that I was having. I didn't realize I was having it, but I was. Um, now I know about memory leaks and how to trace them down and, and how to avoid them for the most part, so I don't have that problem. And obviously the, the, the other problem with mobile phones is their processors aren't as strong as a desktop. I have an i7 over here, which is great. You know, and, and like Tim Cadillac uh, ran an exercise that the Etsy group, had, had, I think at Velocity last year released, a little tool to kind of show you how long it takes to evaluate different JavaScript libraries. And then Tim Cadillac showed you know, jQuery across diff some different devices he had. And I've verified this, verified that. So, like for example, I think Angular would take eight to ten milliseconds on my on my i7 here, but when I would run it on my iPad 2, it would take like uh, 70 to 80 milliseconds or something like that to just 
for the eval process of loading Angular and then evaluating them on every single load. That may not sound like a lot, but if you look at most websites today, they've got they've got you know just 20, 30, 40, sometimes 50 JavaScript files that they're loading, and every single one of those files keeps adding up. So, and a lot of times you've got already got a second or more of just JavaScript evaluation before your application can start, and that's a problem. Uh, as far as the evaluation, I haven't published anything on that because I, I mean I've just played with it. Tim Cadillac, if you go to was it Cadillac.com or just look up Tim Cadillac, is about this time last year, right after Velocity. But Etsy published a little library to kind of test the, the evaluation time. And Tim showed how to do jQuery. And I haven't gone through and done the ones that I did because I, I was just kind of playing around with it to see if it would work or not. But that, that was the rough you know, experience that I had, just loading some of these libraries. All right, we talked a little bit about cellular connections. Obviously, they're slower. They're not. Connection. Um, so obviously, you may or may not even be connected if you're on a cellular connection. Build a site. What does my site cost? Because he was working on a project for Radio Free, for I guess Radio Free Europe or whatever. So they're trying to reach out to developing countries. And so one of the things he realized he had to keep the payload really light because he didn't want people to have to go over their, their, their bandwidth allocation and have to pay a lot of money to download their site. And there was another thing from um, uh, Tammy Everett's stats is that uh, I think like a quarter of the people every month go over their data allotment and then they start paying higher amounts. So what Tim did was he, he if, I, if I know the stats right, he found the lowest published data plan in every country and then he uses web page test and their payload amount there and he calculates how much it costs to download that page so if you're in Vanuatu you're spending tons of money on everything right um, but you'd be surprised you know two three four cents to download a page here in the United States can add up really relatively quickly the amount of people you know amount of stuff you go to especially if you go to like a newspaper site those sites are terrible so so one of the things I try to consider is making sure that my customers don't spend more downloading my page than they're going to spend with me, okay? I forget who came up with it, but we basically we made the web in our own image and it's obese. And so these are some stats. And find some of the other pages in the site and do some testing because I think the interior pages are even worse because the average page I usually see is five to six megs in size so but anyway those home pages the average will carry that to the average home page of the top sites that's a big that's a big thing to me um, the average page has got 21 JavaScript files which is 353 kilobytes and that number is radically rising right now and I think that's a very bad sign um, since I Last update of this slide in, in May, uh, we've increased the number of CSS files to seven, by another one. So now we're, we were 6.4 then, now we're at 7.4. And we've got 69 kilobytes of CSS, which I think is nice. I, don't, I think that's not necessarily the worst number, um, considering that Bootstrap is so popular and really large. Um, and it's becoming more popular. But again, that number is rising quite dramatically. 55 images, 1.4 megs, that's obviously the biggest part of the payload. That's because we're not optimizing our images well. And I had another one in here, fonts, because fonts are big, becoming a bigger deal now. And we've got this issue with what we call FOUT. Basically, there's this flash when the font file gets loaded and it has to re-render everything. Um, and that's kind of slowing things down. We spent up a lot of connections to load these pages up now, getting content from 18 domains. All this stuff is extremely expensive. and We've got to figure out ways to avoid these problems. And that's one of, when I, so when I build applications, I'm, I'm thinking cognitively how to, how to basically fight against these trends. And one of those things is they're fast and as far as getting stuff done. And I probably was too. I mean, jQuery was everything I did until I started doing these spas, and I figured out jQuery was kind of hurting me, right? Usable at that point. 
Um, I've got Bootstrap on here. I use Bootstrap. Let me tell you how to use Bootstrap. Build your own version of Bootstrap. Okay, I'm not joking. They've, they just switched to SAS to, for the new version that's coming out, but they've, they've got a, the current version, I call it Lean Bootstrap is what I make. And basically I just made another less file that references the parts of, of Bootstrap that I use. And that's a very small file, right? And then it, as part of my build process, I have a grunt task. I'm using uh, UnCSS, which uh, Adi Asamadi, I think, wrote. And what you do there is you just load your page with your, your CSS, and what it does is generate a CSS file containing just the CSS you use. So in his test, what he found was the average page that he ran through it was only using 11% of Bootstrap. So consider that when you look at the size of Bootstrap and realize what you're using or not using. Um, you can really make a big difference by, by using something like that, and Post CSS and some of these other ones, the critical CSS plugins, et cetera. I have not used Meteor, so I can't really say one way or another about it. Um, but let me, let me try to talk a little about jQuery. Maybe some of the things will come out maybe you can look for. Okay, yeah. You know, Backbone is not very heavy, but it's full of memory leaks. And, and I know that because somebody came to me trying to figure out why the Backbone had so many memory leaks in it. <laughs> so I haven't built, I haven't done an application with Backbone yet, so I can't. It's, my architecture is actually probably pretty similar to Backbone, but I think my, I think I've, done some things naming-wise and stuff that are a little more convenient. Yes, sir. Ah, yeah. So his, his question was, is Backbone heavy? Which, Backbone's really not heavy, like I said, so. Okay, um, so jQuery. loading times. To interact with the DOM. We, and so what Resig created was a parser of the DOM so that we could go through and do stuff. And there was some performance analysis of jQuery versus, say, vanilla JS and stuff, and I was seeing like 50,000 ti times faster without jQuery to do the same thing, like with query selector all and stuff like that. That made a big impression on me, and so I, I invested a little bit of time to go through and figure out how to actually uh, make something that would, that I, or you know, build an application without using jQuery. So I started looking into alternatives. Yes, uh, I'm absolutely with you. So his question was, uh, do, you, do you think jQuery is more relevant a few years ago than it is today? And it's not, and the reason why it's not as relevant today is because the, the browsers have become more standardized. And we do have functions like document query selector, query selector all, and uh, class name, and, and some other ways to get elements in the DOM that are native. That was a big reason, exactly. Um, is, is at that time, we pretty much had a good standard platform all across. The, the big problem was enterprises are still using Internet Explorer 8, which, by the way, Internet Explorer 8 is going to be unsupported as of January 12th by Microsoft, as is Internet Explorer 9 and Internet Explorer 10. So if you're working with customers, let them know that. The, my, the Internet Explorer team, now the Edge team, would really like everybody else to know that. Um, so the... If you go to my GitHub repo, it's up there. Um, every now and then I'll make a little tweak to it or modification, but it's, I think it's like eight or nine kilobytes in size. It's not very big. It's not gonna support some things in IE8. I don't really care, to be honest with you, so. Um, the other thing is I learned to be more modular. And part of that, process was, uh, there was a couple of videos on, on YouTube by Paul Irish. One's called 10 Things I Learned by Looking at the jQuery Source Code, and then the other one is 11 More Things that I Learned by Looking at the jQuery Source Code. But uh, in the process of watching those videos and kind of studying what he was talking about, I figured out how jQuery is organized. And so when I build a module now, a standalone module, a lot of times I follow that exact same pattern. Uh, so if you use, say, Deep Tissue or, or Toolbar JS, one of the libraries I've written, the syntax should look very familiar to you. Um, and the, do the dollar bill library is, works and looks exactly like jQuery if you actually write, you actually implement it and use it. And it's because I learned how jQuery was structured on the internals 
and made my module to mimic that because I thought it was a really good structure and very repeatable and extensible, which was always a key to me. And it implements the jQuery AJAX function interface, and it's a standalone library. Uh, it's 18 kilobytes, and the reason why it's 18 kilobytes is it has a promises fault polyfill built into it, so it can support promises. Um, I've essentially rewrote something similar to it without the promises, and it's like eight kilobytes now, or less. So um, you can do a pretty good AJAX function and about 20 lines of code if you really want to dig into it. So. Um, So one of the things about these frameworks, so that's why we have libraries that are 100 to 200 to 300 some kilobytes in size before you even start writing your application. You've got so much stuff that you're never going to use that has to get loaded. The other thing is there's a lot of syntactic sugar. Last year I spent a lot of time interviewing potential candidates for customers. It was, it was kind of a weird experience. I, I hadn't really done that that much. So, you know, I put together like four or five dozen, you know, front-end web development questions that I thought would kind of, you know, see where they were at. And I, like I said, I think it was two, two dozen, maybe three dozen people that I interviewed. Not a single person knew how to do anything without jQuery. And I thought that was very disturbing. Yeah, your question? Okay, sure. Um, how do you select a DOM element without jQuery? Not a single person knew how to do it except for get element by ID. That was the only function that anyone knew. So that was that was very eye-opening to me, if nothing else. Um, there was there were some harder questions on there, like you know, explain JavaScript hoisting. Not a single person knew what that was. Um, I'm not sure a lot of people really know what JavaScript hoisting is, and that's okay. I just kind of wanted to see. It was one of those how far out are they, you know, kind of things. Um, I would ask them stuff like, uh, tell me how to use local storage. I had one person that had heard of local storage. So, yeah, that, that, that really kind of showed me where we're at, and there's a, there's a long way we need to go. But part of the problem was basically they're learning how to, how to work with these frameworks compared to knowing what's really going on. Um, and I think that's a shame because what's really going on underneath the hood is very simple at its essence. Um, and you're going to ask me what, which functions these are, but I, don't, I, I, I need to compile the list. But I like to think there's about three dozen API functions we really need to know to build about 95% of our applications. And once you master those, you probably will see really quickly why you don't need any frameworks to help you out. Just understanding basic JavaScript patterns from that point is extremely helpful. And they're, they're loaded with preservatives. Um, by that, I mean they stick around for a long time and they don't really decay, right? So one of the problems with using, say, the Google CDN for stuff is that we've got a very fragmented ecosystem going on out there. So if you go evaluate, say, what version of jQuery, for example, is being used by the typical application, it's all over the place. I see jQuery 1.1, 1.2, 1.3, all the way up to uh, whatever the current one is, 2.0 or whatever now. I very rarely actually see the 2.0, to be honest with you. So we've got a lot of fragmentation going on. The other thing, too, is it seems like these developers also put one and two versions of jQuery or one and two versions of Angular in there as well. And I had a client earlier this year. They you could just like see the strata of how they had evolved. They came from an ASP.NET web forms base, and then on top of that, they threw jQuery during the jQuery strata, okay? And then they started playing with Backbone, so there's this little Backbone strata, and they got bored with that, and then they threw Ember on top of that. They got bored with Ember, then they threw Angular, because that was the latest buzzword, and then this year they're throwing React. So before they ever do anything in their application, they're downloading over a megabyte of JavaScript. Most of it's not even used um, so the, you just don't purge these things out of, out of your applications, it seems like. So these, they tend to just stick around constantly. Um, so his question is, yeah, your question is, is if, with Google backing Angular, is that going to have legs? Right. Yeah, well, what I'm seeing is everybody's walking away from Angular after the 2.0 announcement. And I know a little bit about the Angular team from talking to somebody who worked on the team and walked away because he didn't really like their work ethic. <laughs> um, but um, I, I've not seen, it's not, it's not a mission critical thing to Google. It's, it was something they built for an internal product, evidently. And there's like 
the small group team that actually does it and is coming off that product's budget. So they could honestly just kill it anytime they want to and walk away from it. The only thing that's going to keep it going is really the community. And that's, that's kind of one of the interesting things. You're, I, see, I've wondered why Microsoft didn't create a good front-end framework. They created WinJS, which is a big, giant, bloated thing they built for the native applications. But it's not really good for, for web because it's so big, right? Um, and I haven't, and I don't, I've been wondering why one of the companies doesn't really necessarily truly make their stuff. So if you look at Google applications, they don't really use Angular around the company. Like YouTube built something very similar to what I do because at Velocity last year they, they announced it in one of the sessions and I, I went over the architecture a little bit with them. It's almost identical to what I'm doing. Yeah, well, yeah, well, the Chrome team's not the Angular team. They're totally separate groups. Absolutely. Yeah, the, the Chrome team's big on web performance just as the Edge and the Firefox teams are. Um, you look at their messages, so, yeah. All right, so I'm a big fan of, of micro.js libraries or vanilla.js kind of approach. And stuff. I found a library last year called Rivets. It's 3.6 kilobytes. It has everything as far as binding goes that Angular has, but it's 3.6 kilobytes, not 120 kilobytes, for example. Um, they always have a single focus. They have one thing they're trying to solve, not everything for everybody. And that's another reason why they can be really small. And they really promote this modular architecture. If you have a modular architecture, your application can start very small and grow. If you don't like something, you can swap it out later if something better comes along. For example, um, I've used requests for like four years for my Ajax stack, and then I, you know, I said, you know what, I'm just gonna see if I can write a little Ajax library myself. And I wrote basically everything Ajax-wise and half the size because I didn't use promises. So now I just swapped, I literally swapped it out in, in less than a minute for my library, and my applications just kept going. That's kind of the nice thing about having something like this. You can use like a provider model or whatever and just swap out these things pretty, pretty quickly. So general architecture about these applications, obviously they gotta perform well. I want them to be modular. I want them to have a small footprint for a lot of reasons. They've gotta scale, and that means, that means a lot of things. And a lot of times when we think scalability, we're, th we're thinking like back end, a lot of people hitting our servers and stuff and, and requesting stuff, but scalability also means that people don't pick up the phone and call the help desk all the time because something's broken. That's a bad scaling mechanism because you have to essentially stop and fix all kinds of bugs, so you can't really get your application going. And, and it also needs to be maintainable. And this is where I get a lot of pushback from enterprises, like, well, if you're not using Angular or you're not using React, how can it be maintainable because you're just using all the stuff? But it's just good, solid architecture that you should be using. And obviously, you want your application to have a long lifespan. That's a, that's a total cost of ownership kind of thing, a return on investment thing. That's what the, the C-level guys will look at. How much did it cost me to, to build and maintain this thing and keep it going? Now on. So in the layout part of the stuff, back in 2009, 2010, we all kind of agreed that 960 pixels was how wide we need to make web pages. The problem was, as Sergey was kind of joking earlier today when he was setting up his display, is that we went from this 860 pixel or a 1024 uh, pixel wide world back then to now we've got, you know, thousands of pixels and high pixel densities and stuff. And it was something that wasn't even on our radar back then. So how are you going to say what the world's going to really look like in two years? I mean, how many start, are starting to get into wearables, like, like I've got a band here, you've got an iWatch and stuff like that? That's a whole new ecosystem. But what about TVs? You realize most TVs now that you go buy have browsers in them? If you've got an Xbox or a PlayStation, you've got a browser there. Even a Wii has a browser in it. And so everything we, we've got now, we've got to think about it as our front end or our user experience can be rendered on anything of any shape or size, and we've got to start thinking, how is this going to look in those, those contexts? Have now moved up to the browser, so we need something to manage that logic of changing pages and rendering stuff and, and making database calls effectively and things like that. Now the back end back here, this is pretty much still the same. It's all that big e ecosystem back there. Depending on how complex your application is, it could be a simple flat file storing your data all the way up to some massively distributed uh, service bus kind of architecture with all kinds of web services back there and multiple kind of systems and servers and stuff. 
but basically it all boils up to an API that the front end can call, and I don't really care what goes on back there. One of the, one of the analogies I like to use is a restaurant. When you go to a restaurant, you like to, you're in the front, what they call front of the house. That experience is supposed to be something you're gonna to wanna to come back for, and they wanna make sure that you feel good and, and everything. But then there's this one little, basically there's this one window, let's just say, where they put the orders in, the, the chefs in the back fire up the, the engine in the back, produce the food, and then the, wait, the waiter or waitress or will come get the food and bring it out to your table, and you never have to know all that stuff that's going on behind the scenes. That's effectively what we've got here, too. We've got a little window in the middle, and we've got this great front-end experience, but we've got this whole back of the house that's a totally different world back there, too. All we really care about as consumers of, this, of these applications is what that front looks like and what that experience was like. And so that's where I live. The critical path stuff, basically it's just the master layout for the core application. And I'm gonna, I've gotten to the point where I, I inline what I call critical CSS, basically the minimal amount of CSS to get that first part rendered. Because I can't assume what page the person wants to load because the server has no knowledge of what page that they're trying to load. The front end does, but the server side doesn't, right? So I want to give at least the basic footer, header kind of experience usually. And the fr front, I'm going to kind of try to consider what are the initial possible views somebody could go to. So like in the case of my blog, I know most likely you've got a link to one of my article pages, so that's obviously going to be there. But if I've got um, a, an application that requires a login or something like that, or an onboarding process, I'm probably just going to have the logging and onboarding process in my what I call my critical markup, right? And everything that's behind that login is secondary. I can load that kind of lazy loaded. And so I'm going to do that. Um, so what I do is I load, I have the critical CSS for the layout, and I try to figure out those views so I get the markup, the CSS, and, and the basic JavaScript to drive the, the application and, and those particular views. And then I'll, if the application is large enough, I'll have a, what I call the hash fragment, something's got to catch that change and then do stuff. And you cache that. you know, and, you know, fancy. And that handles generally my routing parts for me. And then I've got a view engine. This is kind of something new that I created this year. It's not the concept. Of that is managing a lot of caching the, the parts and parsing out the, the, the views and the templates and stuff like that. with mustache or handlebars, that's a, that's a push rendering uh, mechanism. What I, what I prefer for my personal stuff, though, is, a, is about a 21-line function, and it's based on a, a function that John Resig created. So back in 2009, when I started doing this client-side rendering, I used his, what he called, micro-templating function. And it's about 20, 21 lines of code. And there was somebody, I think he's in Hungary or Turkey, I can't remember which, he kind of modified it a little bit, and I, I'm using his version of it at this point. But literally, it's like 21 lines of code, and it does pretty much everything that Mustache does for me. There's a few things that it doesn't do, but I can live without them, to be honest with you. So I've gone, so you can see, I've got next to nothing that's really handling the rendering part for me. Now, my application itself, I have a module for just the application, and generally, I dangle the controllers off of that. The controller, if you're familiar with the MVC model, that's kind of what I follow. Uh, the controller kind of drives the view itself. Uh, view specific stuff. And then over on the data side, 
I usually have a, a, a data library specific to the application, and I use class inheritance, uh, which is kind of an ES6 thing, but again, I'm gonna fall back to John Rezik. He created a nice little base class module a few years back that I started using, and essentially allow, it's essentially what the ES6 spec looks like is the way he wrote that, that particular module. So it allows me to do some inheritance. So I have like, you know, a whole stack in there, but I've got a cache object, and what I do, then I just pull it out of local storage because that's about a five millisecond hit usually. If, it's, if I don't have a valid data, a version of that data, I'll go make the actual AJAX call back to the server. And the reason why I wanna do that is the fastest request you can make is the one you don't make, right? So anytime I don't have to go over the wire, I, I'm a lot better off because that AJAX call could take a few seconds, maybe even a minute to come back depending on what it takes to build all that data. For example, I've got a call with one of my, that I'm making to one of my customer systems and if I don't filter out the columns that I'm returning, it could take 20 to 30 seconds to return. And that, that can be deadly when you're sitting there waiting, right? So I wanna try to avoid any kind of calls to the server as much as I can. This is also another way to make your application scale because anytime you don't have to make a request and fire off everything in, in the server to go get data that should be cached, um, then your backend systems aren't as taxed. And you know, like I had, a, I had a client about four years ago, and they had an application that was averaging 13 and a half minutes to load before their, their line of business, their in, internal employees could even use it. And one of the problems was they were, they were loading a full table of every single city and county in the United States every single morning when the person logged in. And I said, well, how often does that data actually change? And they go, never. And I went, then just cache it on the client in perpetuity. You know, and they didn't understand that, right? But that was part of the reason why everything was choking because they had 1,500 people three different times a day try to fire up these applications and 13 and a half minutes was their average load time. They're sitting there paying people to do nothing, right? 1,500, 4,500 people a day. You can do the math on that, right? So anyway, um, so this is kind of more or less how my stuff lays out. It's very simple. There's not a whole lot of complexity to it. Keep it really lean, and I'm talking like maybe a 100 or 200 DOM elements in there, your application is going to run a whole lot faster. And if you, there's actually one of the, the stats that HDB Archive monitors is how many DOM elements are in the average page. Um, and then, like I said, I keep talking about this leverage browser. All right. Right, so if you go read uh, Ilya Grigorik's book, uh, is it HTTP networking? Yeah, HTTP networking. Um, hmm? Browser. Browser networking, okay. Well basically, there's this concept of HTTP slow start, and what goes on when you make a request over, over TCP is it returns things in packets, right? But the first packet is 16 kilobytes. Two kilobytes of that 16 kilobytes is like header data, right? So it's not relevant to the, the actual data you're trying to transfer. So you get 14 kilobytes. So anything over 14 kilobytes goes into the next packet, which is, I believe, 32 kilobytes. So basically you get this, what we call latency built up as it goes back and forth to try to get everything. So if you look at, say, a 120 kilobyte JavaScript library, for example, you, you get the first 14 kilobytes, then you get the next 30 kilobytes and so forth. So it probably takes four round trips to get that full library. Whereas I can load pretty much my entire application. Not very big. Uh, I've got like a, I think a four, uh, 24 page spa that I've been working on right now. And my markup on that G zipped is right at five kilobytes, I think in the, with the CSS and everything. So, you know, it's, it's usually pretty small. Um, Uh, 
uh, can't think of his first name off the top, but he works, he works for The Guardian, but uh, most people give the BBC the, the credit for creating this concept. Um, more or less what you do is you, you quickly test to see if the browser is capable of running your application. If not, you redirect them back to a simple version that will run in a, in a legacy browser, for example. So you use feature detection, and you don't worry about writing your application for legacy browsers. So let's, let's say IE8 and a lot of cheap old Androids, for example. Um, and don't use polyfills. Don't worry about polyfilling for fi functionality that, say, a six-year-old browser doesn't support that wasn't even thought of six years ago. Um, really helps your application work a whole lot better. This concept also can be your Greenscape, right? You have to sign up for it. So at that point, you, you kind of know if they're coming to your site, they're probably on a modern browser. Yeah, so I, I probably wouldn't even worry about cutting the mustard in your, your case, for example. So. The next view, next time around, it doesn't really matter because they've already got the content to drive the application. You're listing, you know, the, the, the movies that are in the theaters today for 24 hours, that's not a bad thing. Now, if I had a stock trading application, I probably wouldn't even bother caching the stock feed at all because that's something I need real time. And I'd probably set up something like a socket or something like that. Now, by doing that, I obviously eliminate a lot of redundant HTTP. And the data that's stored in local storage. That means I don't have to go back to the server and get it because, quite honestly, in this case, the, the furniture store, the data is not going to change that often. Um, despite, I did have a customer that I pulled these images where the, they went out of business like 10, 12 years ago. But they used to be freaked out because they, they thought people would constantly be sitting there just reloading their pages. And I'm like, people don't sit there and just hit F5, you know? <laughs> so. Um, is go over to the application itself and kind of start playing around. So like ten or twelve years ago, like two thousand five time frame or somewhere in there, I can't remember. But, you know, it's fully responsive, and it is a spa. Let me just get this. So you can see kind of how it changes, and I just got a simple horizontal scroll to switch to different panels and stuff. It's kind of my toolbar library in play. Go backwards.
in the address bar, you can see them on the categories page. And so I got this hash. Without the bang part there, but that's kind of the de facto standard. It was either Twitter or Google who kind of made that the de facto standard by using it and propagating it. Uh, came from where? Flash. Came from Flash. Okay, this is the first time I've heard it come, has come from Flash. So, okay, all right, I'll take that. It, it was it's there. Uh, I think I kind of remember the Silverlight guys using it too, yeah, for deep linking. So, so anyway, so that that is a route right there, that categories. Now, that's a very simple route, but if I hit one of these categories, category now with a variable called living now I'm on a a product view and then what product it is essentially an ID for me to be able to pull up that particular product okay so that that keys in stuff into the my system and you can see how fast this is coming up right I didn't have to go back to the server to request everything, and, and, and it all loads pretty quickly. And I'm on the same Wi-Fi you guys are on. So, um, and even over like hotel Wi-Fi, other than when so, what's actually going on? Let me just kind of walk you through some of this because this is where it gets fun. And what I am going to do is change my display. And, this, and so that piles up relatively quickly. If you want to, afterwards, I'll show you a, a memory profile I did of Facebook and just shows the, the trend going up and, and how bad that can be. That's, that's one of the things you want to make sure you don't do. So my libraries don't hang on to any DOM references whatsoever. At the same time, my DOM's relatively thin. Now, there are a lot of script references here. Again, this is not the production version. This is what I call development version. Now, I like to keep my files very focused on what they're trying to do, makes debugging it a whole lot easier when I got the individual files, but for production, I want the one file. That's gonna change with HTTP2, but I want, I'm not gonna go into that tonight.
And that's effectively what's going on here is the logic to render the, uh, the view itself. So let me just go, let me just kind of show you some of the stuff that I'm doing in the application itself because we're getting out of time, I think. But um, this is the main application part. So anything that has to, one-time calls, and so I'm going to do that here. All right. Um, one more thing I wanted to show is the local storage. It's down here somewhere. There we go. So Chrome and Edge... On Go to that yeah, category is good. All right. I give every view an ID tag. But for now, I'm still using the script element because that's universal still. The reason why I do that is I don't want the browser to render this markup because if I put it in a, in a div, for example, this markup's going to get rendered even though I don't want it to get rendered, or I have to hide it and stuff like that, and it gets kind of nasty. But if you put it in a script tag, the browser's going to ignore it. The trick is making the, uh, the type not JavaScript. That keeps it to be, that makes it non-block. So pass some values that my spa libraries build that JSON object you saw with the views. And so it's going to associate this. So this is the route. So I showed you like the category, and I told you there was a parameter in here. And so I'm defining this parameter with a little semicolon or with the colon here, and the name is name. So inside of that controller, when that response the way it needs to get rendered. And then the rest of this is just the stuff to, to hold the, the con to drive the actual experience. So I think I'm running a little bit short on time now. Um, if you've got any questions, feel free to ask me, because um, there's a lot more depth to this. Um, so go ahead. OK, so one of the things I don't do is I don't do, uh, his question was, um, how do I maintain state across views, right? So one thing, yeah. And so one of the things I, I did try was the, uh, the history API, because a lot of people like to stuff the, con the, the actual view, say, in the history API, and then pull it right back out the way it was. I'm not a big advocate of doing that. I found that to be problematic. I did try that for a while, and I just found a lot of issues doing that. Uh, instead, since I've got my data cached locally, usually, um, I'm just rehydrating from the data itself. And so I get the same exact view, but I've got a lot more control over it than if I pushed it into the history uh, storage. Well, okay, so that, that's going to be a deep link, right? So those variables, I mean, this is just a, a simple one here with one variable in it. I've had other ones that are three or four, like you're talking about, right? So his question is, what if I had more of these variables in the, in the slug, in the route, right? So how am I going to manage that state to do that? Well, because of the way that my controller is just hydrate itself based on the data, it's going to go re-render itself, right? So it knows how to go get all the data wherever it needs to be. And because the, a lot of times because the data is cached, it gets hydrated really quickly, right? So that's, that's kind of how it happens. Is there a benefit? It depends on the nature of the application because 
in this case, the, these are what I could, would consider generally simple ones, and for the most part, they tend to be that way. But you could get to one where you've got something where you, you're essentially defining the variables like, like uh, date from, date to ranges on like a bank account, for example, and give me all the transactions that have this particular customer name in it or something like that. Those, those URLs could get, say, long. So that in that case, that it, I don't think it really matters because you're, you're going to kind of have to build that query one way or another to get the data. So are there any other questions? Uh, the tools to use memory leaks. OK, um, all the browser developer tools, so if you have 12 in any of the browsers, they have performance audit tools in there. Um, there's an art to using them. That's, that's where the real trick is. The Chrome team has some videos out there. Um, the Edge team has a few that I know about up on channel nine. I don't know about Firefox, to be honest with you. It, I say it's an art because it's not obvious a lot of it. And I think most web developers that are trying to play with it get really lost really quickly. One of the, one of the rules I've, I've kind of come up with is if it's code you wrote, it's going to be a lot easier to track the memory leaks because you understand how it's built. But if you're going into a library that you didn't write, like say like React, you're going to get lost really fast because you just don't know what, what it's really referencing because usually it's minimized and obfuscated and stuff like that. So. Um, there's, there's a little art to it. I'm talking to the guy who really knows that stuff inside and out on the Edge team. He agrees with me. You kind of have to know the code that you're, you're profiling to, to do it effectively. So, but you can see the memory profile in, increases and stuff. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so his question is, how do I manage dependencies? Um, so this library is dependent on another library and stuff. Part of, the, part of the benefit of the way I build applications is I want libraries that stand alone so there really is no dependency that I have to worry about. Um, if a library has a dependency on stuff, um, a lot of times I just go figure out the piece that I'm needing, how that works, and then I go write my own little module to do exactly what, I'm, what it needs to be doing. Um, and that's not as hard as you think it is. I think a lot of people think that's extremely hard. It's usually pretty easy to do. Once you've done it once or twice, it becomes second nature to do that, I think. I, I'm a big advocate of not using require JS. Every application I've gone in on that it has required JS, it's about 10 times larger than it needs to be. Um, the worst case was uh, a single page application that, that I was asked to figure out why it took five minutes to load. They had 850 pages they were loading and like 600 JavaScript files that they were loading. It was a really bad scenario, um, but it was primarily because of require. And when I see require being used, like that's, that's a big part of, uh, like the, the uh, React ecosystem, it seems like, is require. Those applications are extremely bloated, a lot because of require, because um, even with the flattening stuff you can get, you've got a lot of nested dependencies that are the exact same code. So like I, I use Node to build a lot of tools now, really. I don't really use it for websites, per se, but I use it for tooling now. And simple little tools that I'm building, just essentially what would have been console applications in the past, are four and five and 10 and 20 megabytes in size because of the, the dependency chain that NPM kind of imposes with the required JS structure. And it's making it really hard for me to, to just push these up to be web jobs because they're just these super duper nested profiles. So I'm not a big fan of using stuff like required JS. And if you follow the patterns and stuff that I advocate, you shouldn't have a problem with that because I'm, I'm trying to avoid interdependencies between things because I want to be able to exchange that out anytime I want to is, is another thing. So, okay, so his question is, I want to get rid of promises. That's, that's kind of wrong. I don't want to get rid of promises. It's just they're not really supported natively in the browsers right now. So do I want to load 10 to 20 extra kilobytes so that I can have some syntactic sugar for, to make my developer life technically easier? One of the things that, that I see people like, well, you don't want to get into the pyramid of doom with callbacks. I've never been in a pyramid of doom. I, I don't know how you get into a pyramid of doom. Um, so. Anonymous functions, it, yeah. It, it, generally, I've got one layer with that. And so it's not, to me, it's not that big a deal. And I'm calling, usually I'm using an anonymous function to call my real function. So to me, it's not that big a deal. So I don't really get this uh, you know, callback pyramid thing. I am anxiously awaiting promises to be native because then I don't have to load the polyfill effectively. And there's some things that I'm doing that like when service workers become native, you can rip out some of the caching mechanisms that I'm doing, for, for example, because service workers and HTTP2 are going to kind of work together to make some of the stuff that I'm doing. Yeah, uh, they're going to, this, some of this caching strategy with the, mar the markup and stuff, 
it's also going to kind of replace AppCache, which is one of the reasons why I built what I did, because AppCache was kind of a pain to work with. So I kind of went around it and kind of managed my, my caching and my stuff myself. HTTP2 and service workers are going to kind of make that obsolete. So what I'm doing now is going to be native in the near future, and I'm really, really kind of anxious for that. So, so I'm, not, I'm not against promises. I'm waiting for them to be native, and then I'll start leveraging them more, absolutely. Have I looked at transpilers from a performance perspective? Um, uh, not in a scientific way, in an anecdotal way, yes. Um, I had one project that wanted to use an e the Babel transpiler. It really bloated the code. Um, yeah, well, I, that's one of the things I don't like when I come across a library that's done in CoffeeScript. I can't really fix it very well, but that's okay. I can at least read the code that it generates. Um, I, there's things in ES6 that I like. There's a lot of it I think is completely useless. And so when you run it through there, you get all that useless crap too, which is basically polyfilled. Um, Kyle Sampson's like a big JavaScript uh, personality, right? And he did a great session uh, at the Edge Summit back in May. If you go to Channel 9 and you look up the Edge Summit, um, Kyle Sampson, if you, he's Getify on Twitter, by the way. Um, he talked about ES6. That's what his whole session was about. And he's like, you know, 90%, I think 90, 95% of it, I'm probably never going to use. And I agree with him. I, I, mean, I like class inheritances, and I like promises. The rest of it, I don't know. It's, I don't know if it's really going to add that much value to my life. So do I really want to worry about a transpiler, because I can do all the stuff already, and I have been for years. So it does, to me, it's not that much value. And you know, go ahead and writing something now that the browser support next year, just because I can do it now, I don't know if it really gains us anything. PCI compliance, that's like credit cardy stuff, right? Yeah. Um, you know, I don't know how to answer that because, like, the credit card data and stuff like that would be back in the server, right? So that'd be more the back end pieces to it. I would not store credit card information in local storage. That's 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 a that's a data storage decision. Now, I don't, when I say I cache the data locally, I don't always cache all the data. It depends on the nature of the data, how long I cache it, and if I cache it at all. Like I said, if it's like stock ticker information, what now? Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah, but it, you know, like things like counties, zip codes, and states. Nah, I'm just gonna cache that forever because that doesn't change very often, right? We got the, our last state in 1958, I think. So uh, I don't. Puerto Rico is trying, but you know, we'll see. Um, you know, things like that, or you know, you can look at your data and know what's going to change and stuff. So like the the application I'm working on right now is kind of a monitoring system. There's a bunch of data that I can cache quickly and early that never changes, but then there's pieces of it that change all the time, and I don't cache that at all. So, yeah, it just depends on the nature of your data. So, all right.